Good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. We have come to rejoice and to be glad in it. Now, are you all ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Are you ready to sing? We need y'all to sing with us this morning. It's real easy. And if the Lord has been your shelter, if he has been your peace in the time of storm, then this can be your testimony. You can wave your hands, you can clap your hands, you can stand up on your feet, but we just want you to join in with worship, amen? All right, here we go. See, you can rock from side to side. You are my shelter. Oh Lord, you are my shelter. You are my peace in the time of storm. You are my peace in the time of storm. Oh Lord, you're my way maker. Oh Lord, you're my way maker. I'll praise your name forevermore. I'll praise your name forevermore. Say, oh Lord, you are my shelter. Oh Lord, you are. Say you're my peace in the time of storm. You're my peace in the time of storm. Oh Lord, you are my way maker. Oh Lord, you're my way maker. And I'll praise your name forevermore. I'll praise your name forevermore. Say, oh Lord, you are my shelter. Oh Lord, you are my shelter. You're my peace in the time of storm. You're my peace in the time. Say, oh Lord, you're my way maker. Oh Lord, you're my way maker. And I'll praise your name forevermore. I'll praise your name forevermore. Say, oh Lord, you are my shelter. Oh Lord, you are my shelter. You're my peace in the time of storm. You're my peace in the time of storm. Oh Lord, you're my way maker. Oh Lord. And I'll praise your name forevermore. I'll praise your name forevermore. Oh, Lord, you're my shelter. Oh, Lord, you are my shelter. You're my peace in the time of storm. You're my peace in the time of storm. Say, oh, Lord, you're my way maker. Oh, Lord, you're my way maker. I'll praise your name forevermore. I'll praise your name Oh, we 
have just come this morning ready to lift up the name of Jesus and to have a worship experience. How many of you came this morning to have a worship experience? How many of you came ready for an encounter with the Father this morning? Ready to feel his presence saturate the building? I encourage you this morning to leave whatever it is that you brought in this place. Any worry, any stress, any anger, whatever it is that you came in here with, leave it. Close your eyes and magnify the Lord for his goodness and his mercy to us. Allow yourself to have a worship experience this morning with the Father. Allow him to saturate your spirit with his presence and make you whole. Oh God, we bless you this morning and we invite you into this place, God. Move by your spirit. Let your glory fill the temple this morning. We invite your worship experience this morning, God. Bless your name, Jesus. Connection with your spirit. With your 
to fill this temple. We thank you for the worship experience this morning. We thank you for moving by your spirit, God, and being everything that we need in this place, oh God. Continue to pour your spirit out, God. Pour your love, God. Pour your peace and pour your joy on this place, oh God. We thank you for being our provider, God. For being our salvation and our deliverer, God, and everything that we need, God. Lord God, we bless you and honor you in this place, oh God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for Thank being you, with us, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We honor you in this place, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all you've done through your son. Thank you for all you do. You brought
sit in your seat. We simply ask you to join in with us. Praise the Lord. Open your mouth and just say something. Hallelujah. Come on, praise the Lord with us. Come on, saints. Give up the high praise. Come on, come on, give it up.
fucking stand and everybody. I would open my mouth and say something. Yeah.
Oh, praise the Lord. You know, I just love that song. Over and over and over again, he keeps on blessing me. Thank you, choir. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Uh, my brothers and sisters, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Matthew, uh, the fourth chapter. And we're going to look at verses 23 through 25, the end of the fourth chapter of Matthew. And then we're going to turn and take a look at Matthew, the 10th chapter, and we'll look at verse 1, and then we'll look at verses 5 through 8. Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 10. When you have it, of course, it's going to be up there on the screen. Will you stand uh, for the reading of God's word? Praise the Lord. Let's uh, read it together. We don't have a lot to read uh, this morning, so let's read this together. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Hmm. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Amen, amen. And now... In uh, Matthew, the 10th chapter, I'll, I'll read this. Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 1. From the word of God. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And then he goes on to mention the names of the 12 apostles. And then verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter in any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Look at this. Freely you have received, freely give. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Subject of our sharing uh, this morning is go and get what you see in God's word. Go and get what you see in God's Word. Thank you, Zoe. That's right. That's, what, that's the kind of encouragement the preacher needs. Go and get what you see uh, in God's Word. Let's go to God in prayer. In turn to God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this moment of sharing. And I know that there are quite a few uh, sacred theological cows that we may not even be aware of, Lord. But I certainly pray that you would open the hearts and the minds of your people. I pray uh, that you would help us to see what you have for us in your word. And even as Moses ascended on the mountain and he bowed down before you in humility, likewise, Lord, we bow down before you and we ask that you would speak to us right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, let church say amen. 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 Go and get what you see in God's Word. I know you're like, what, what are you talking about? Huh? Go and get what you see in God's Word. Last week in the sermon, uh, I talked about how I prayed for Elijah, uh, how I went after this virus he had a couple of weeks ago, how I went out at this virus with a certain amount of anger and fervency, and how it may have been anywhere from around 15 to 25 minutes of commanding this thing in the name of Jesus to get out of my son before he experienced relief. So I had success. But I also wanted to share with you that I did share with you that uh, I didn't go fully all the way because he got relief but not total healing. 
But even though he had relief on Thursday, he was healed completely by, by Saturday. But, but having said that, I don't want you to think that I think that that example that I used is the norm. I was really just trying to share with you that there are times when we need, when you and I need to be persistent in prayer and not give up. Because the moment you give up, that's the moment that the enemy wins. Do you hear what I'm saying? The moment you give up, the enemy wins. And there are times, and there just may be times, when you, unbeknownst to you, you are just one more prayer away from victory over a sickness, a disease, a condition, or some situation that you may be facing. You, you may not know, but you just might be one more prayer away from victory. And so, as an example last week, I talked about uh, the Canaanite woman, or uh, in Mark, she's referred to as a Syrophoenician woman who kept on crying out after Jesus to heal her daughter until she got what she wanted. And she kept crying out of Jesus so much, and Jesus didn't answer her, that finally his disciples urged him and said, Lord, will you please talk to this woman? And the woman approached him, and she bowed down before Jesus, and she said, Lord, help me. And then Jesus said something that most of us are offended by, but it was something that, 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 that was really apropos of what we were talking about. Jesus said to the woman, he said, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And she said, yes, it is, Lord, because even the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And I told you, someone pointed out something to me that I'd never seen in this scripture before. And they asked the question, they said, what is the children's bread? Because Jesus said to this Canaanite woman, to this, to this Gentile woman, he said, it's not right to take the children's bread and to give it to the dogs. Well, what did the woman want? Well, this woman wanted healing for her daughter, and so the children's bread that Jesus was talking about is healing, right? So as a son or daughter of God, as a child of God, the bread that the Lord has for you, the bread that is your right to, for you to have is healing. Now, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing, huh? The woman, this woman, this woman who technically was not a child of God was given the children's bread because she was persistent and because she had faith, right? So now when I talk about being persistent in prayer, I'm not saying that all prayer is a struggle that will last for hours and weeks and months on end, but just like you go to the gym to lift weights, if you want a body like uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, all right, if you want a body like that, then it's obvious you're going to have to put some time in, right? You're going to have to change your diet. You're going to have to change your routine. You're going to have to put some time in, and that's really what being persistent in prayer is all about. There are times, my brothers and sisters, when you're going to have to put some time in and some effort in prayer, right? Let me give you another example of being persistent, or let me say, or, or, or hanging in there until the battle is won, because prayer really is spiritual warfare, right? Hanging in there until the battle is won. In Exodus, the 17th chapter, Exodus, the 17th chapter, about two or three months after the Israelites left Egypt, the Bible says that they were attacked in the desert by the Amalekite people. And so Moses told Joshua, he said, choose some men from among us and go out and fight against them. Now, this was Israel's first battle. Three months ago, they had been slaves in Egypt, and this was their first battle. And so Joshua did what Moses told him to do. He went out to fight the Amalekites. And while he did that, uh, Moses and his brother Aaron, who was a high priest, and, and her, his nephew, they went to the top of a hill overlooking the battle. The Bible tells us that as mo long as Moses held his hands up with the staff in his hands, it tells us that the Israelites were winning. But whenever Moses lowered his hands, it says that the Amalekites would start winning. And it tells us that in his role as intercessor, 
It tells us that Moses' arms grew so weary that he couldn't lift them any longer, right? So you know that when he couldn't lift them any longer, that was a bad time for Israel down there on the battlefield. But it says that his brother Aaron and his nephew Hur, they got a stone and they sat Moses on it. And then they both got on both sides of him and they lifted up his hands and they held his arms up until the setting of the sun. And that is how Joshua and the Israelites finally defeated the Amalekites. Now, now, can you get the picture that I'm trying to show you? As long as Moses' hands were up, the Israelites were winning, right? But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Now, if you can take a picture of that, it's like whenever Moses' hands were up, his folk were winning. Whenever he dropped them, the Amalekites were winning. And so there was sort of like this back and forth, this tug of war on the battlefield. And I say that because, listen, the Israelites won because Moses had two other men with him who were helping him. Do you see what I'm trying to say? In his role as intercessor. Now, now that's why I believe the scriptures say it is good when you have two or three people who will agree with you. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew, the 18th chapter, he said, if two or three of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In other words, sometimes we need help in the fight. And this is really how I feel prayer teams, Brother Miller, Reginald Miller, this is how I feel prayer teams ought to work, right? They ought to, they ought to have a goal in mind. They ought to have an objective when you pray. Uh, you ought to pray for the sick, or pray for family matters, or financial matters, or mental health issues, or whatever. But you ought to have a goal in mind so that when God answers that prayer, you can say, this is what God has done for that person. You got to pray, and you got to stick with it until you get the victory, like Moses, Aaron, and her. Because, you know, when we're praying, and I thought about that time I was with my son, somebody is bound to get tired. But when you have two or three people with you, you can give each other strength. You can give each other encouragement in the midst of the battle, and you can gain the victory, right? Now, I believe, my brothers and sisters, when we lay hands on the sick, like Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, they will recover. And, 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 and when we begin to exercise our authority, as sons and daughters of God, then we can drive the enemy out of our territory and whatever territory we wish to claim. As we, as we mature or as we grow in the faith, uh, another way of saying that as we gain experience in the battle, a battle that may have lasted 30 minutes or hours or a few weeks when we first started, it may take less than five minutes or five seconds for that matter to get a person healed when we mature in the faith, just like Jesus did it, right? But, of course, you got to start somewhere. And let me say this. If you, have already, if you have already been baptized with the Holy Spirit, then you already have the power or the muscles, so to speak, to do the works of God. Uh, they just might need to be developed, right? Now, I want you to understand that I'm talking about you, church members, all right? I'm talking about us. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the potential that you have to do the real work of ministry. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about putting cones out on the parking lot or handing people bulletins or picking up paper after the church service. Listen, all of that is very important and it's needed and it's helpful and we are immensely thankful to those who do that because we need that. But I am talking about, when I say real ministry, I'm talking about the potential that you have to set people free who are being oppressed and bullied by enemy forces. I'm talking about setting people free from addiction and disease and bondage of all kinds that some of us in here are experiencing right now. 
I'm talking about the potential you have to live out the gospel by healing and offering people salvation. That is what I'm talking about. That's right. See, that way, if you get involved in that, that way the Bible and the gospels won't be such a mystery to you, right? And, and church won't just be another thing that you put on your bucket list or attach to your resume, right? You know how time we write resume and say, well, you know, I'm a deacon and I'm a trustee and I've been in the choir. You know, that's my community service, see? One time, my brothers and sisters, you understand what I'm saying? I'm glad, I'm glad you called that. It was a little late, but that's all right. One time, my brothers and sisters, I was meeting with a friend that I can talk with freely about these kind of things. And I was complaining, man. I was, I was like the children of Israel. And I was grumbling about the fact that even though the Scripture says that God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, he's given us power, he's given us healing, he's given us faith, etc., etc. I was complaining about the fact that one particular gift that I wanted seemed to be beyond my reach. I felt like a child might feel trying to get something that somebody put on a shelf far beyond my reach. And even as I began to act that out, I was talking about, I began to act that out. The Lord spoke to me clearly. He said, you may not feel that you can reach it right now, but you will grow taller and reach it with no problem, huh? You will grow tall. In the That's what I heard the Lord say to me very clearly. And I thought about this. You know, when I was a child, my parents would have to get a glass for me out of the cabinet. But I remember this vividly. When I was around, somewhere around six years old, I got to the point where I was able to jump up on the counter. My feet would be hanging off the counter. I would balance myself. I would open the cabinet door, all right? I would get a glass for myself. I would put the glass down on the counter. I would close the cabinet, and then I would jump off. You know why? Because I wanted to get my own glass and pour my own juice or milk or whatever liquid it was, right? But then sometime after that, I didn't have to jump up onto the counter, right? I just had to get up on my tiptoes to open the cabinet and reach the glass in there pull it down and close the door. Well, I don't know how long it's been now because I can't remember. Uh, but I don't have to get on my tiptoes anymore, right? I just walk up and open the door of the cabinet and get a glass, and I don't even have to hold it with two hands anymore. I can just pour my drink, right? Now, what I'm trying to show you is that even before I could do all of those things, I always had the potential to get the glass out of the cabinet. I had the potential, even as a two-year-old, to pour my own drink. But what had to happen? I had to grow into it. I had to mature, right? Well, the same principle applies to the things of the Spirit. And there are some things in God's Word that not only you're going to have to grow into, but you're going to have to have the drive and the desire to go and get it for yourself, right? I wanted to hop up on the counter. For whatever reason, that's it. I wanted to hop up on that counter and get my own glass. Do you want to hop up on the counter and get healing for yourself and others? Do you want to hop up on that counter so that you can experience the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of faith, or the power of God's Word? Do you want to hop up on that counter and experience a relationship with God and walk with Him as Christ walked with Him? You know, some things in this life, not only do you have to grow into, but you have to have the drive to go and get it for yourself. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it seems to me at times, perhaps in my more uh, pessimistic moment, it seems to me at times that the church's drive and the members of the church's drive has been diminished to wanting to have a good program about something. Uh, well, the program runs smoothly, huh? The music is always on point. Uh, the worship is so nice where everybody gets into their feelings, right? And the speaker does a nice job. And if some things are not quite right, then we have to make sure that we get it right because it's all about the presentation. But is anybody concerned about the power of the gospel to transform lives? Is anybody willing 
to stand by faith and declare that the word of God will do what it says. You know, Paul said something to me that was so very instructive. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 20, he said, the kingdom of God is not just a matter of words. It's not just a matter of talk. It's not just a matter of discussion in a classroom. But Paul said the kingdom of God is also a matter of power. There are times when I think we know only half of the gospel. We talk and we talk and we talk and we teach and we teach and we teach. You know, I go to conferences, conferences uh, where there is sermon after sermon after sermon. Four sermons before 12 o'clock. But rarely do we see the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of the kingdom of God manifested right here in America, huh? You see it across the water, but not right here in America, huh? But now, but now when you look, when you go back and look at our text, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had the drive. It didn't just, it did just come to him. He had the drive to go after more of what God offered. And he gave that drive to his disciples as well. I want to read the text to you one more time, all right? Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, and he spoke the word of God, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, but then he proved that the gospel is the gospel. He proved that the kingdom of God was here. And look what it says, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He was in Galilee at first. News about him spread all over Syria. It went outside of the country. And people from Syria brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and the Bible says he healed them. Well, he was in Galilee. The news spread north outside of Israel to the country of Syria. But then it says in verse 25, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem in southern Israel, and Judea, and the region across the Jordan, outside of the country, those people followed him. Isn't that something? That's amazing to me. And then it says in Matthew, the 10th chapter, then got so much for him, so many crowds, Jesus needed to delegate what he had. So as Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and then he gave them, he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These 12, verse 5 says, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. This is evangelism. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, how would they know it's come near? This is how you're going to do it. Back it up. Heal the sick. That's how they will know that the kingdom of heaven is near. Raise the dead. That's how they will know that the kingdom of heaven is here. Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. That's how they will know that the kingdom of heaven is near. Freely you have received, freely give it away, right? You ain't got to get up on a platform and ask people to give you money in order for you to heal them, in order for you to set them free. You just do it because I freely gave it to you. You freely give it to somebody else. Now, what I have just described whether you understand it or not, is the fact that Jesus came here and like Joshua in the Old Testament, he was engaged in warfare. He was engaged in destroying the things that the enemy had placed among people upon this earth. And what he began to do was he began to take territory from the enemy. That's why Jesus called himself a strong man. You know, let me tell you something. This is a strong man's gospel. 
Do you hear how I said? This is a strong man's gospel, right? How it is not for the weak. It is not for those who are easily intimidated. And if you are, the Lord will strengthen you in your spirit on the inside so that you might fight the good fight of faith that Paul was talking about. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? This is a strong man's gospel, and we, as Jesus' disciples today, we are here to drive the enemy out of not only our own lives, but the lives of those around us. And that's why you've got to understand what the Word of God says so that you can do it yourself. What does the Bible say he did? It says that he proclaimed the gospel, healed the sick, set free the demon-possessed. He brought God's kingdom near to people. And what I've been trying to say to you, my brothers and sisters, for the last year and a half is that you have you, not just me, but you have the potential to bring God near to those around you, right? That's what Aaron said in her prayer. That's our job. <laughs> That's what we're here to do, to bring God near to those around us. You have the potential. You have the potential to set the captives free. You have the potential to set those who are prisoners of war free. But there are some things in God's kingdom, in God's economy, there are some things right here in God's word that you need the desire and the drive to go and get for yourself. You got to have that drive. You got to have the desire to hop up on that counter and get that glass that the Lord has in his heavenly cabinet. And you got to learn how to get that glass out the cabinet and put some liquid in it. So that you can give that heavenly liquid, whether it's healing or whether it's freedom from depression, whatever it might be, you have the potential to give it to them. Huh? You have the potential to give the people of the world a drink. I know now that I'm not mistaken. I'm not naive. I know that many of us in here need a drink for ourselves. Sometimes that's why we can't see ourselves as Jesus' disciples. But whatever has you weakened, whatever has you crippled, whatever has you lame spiritually or Physically, I want you to understand that this is a strong man's gospel. And Jesus came to set you free. And it's not a metaphor. He really came to set you free. He really came to deliver you from that which has you in bondage. It is a strong man's gospel. So now when you read the Bible, don't just overlook certain things that Jesus did because it's for you. Everything that Jesus did, he did as an example because he wanted those after him to do the very things. He didn't stay here forever, right? And don't think that when Jesus left, the kingdom of God withdrew. You know that, don't you? You do know that he left his Holy Spirit. Those of us who have given our lives to him, our spirits have been reborn again. And he also said to his disciples, he said, if you would just wait, you will receive power on high. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit so that they might have the power to unchain and to those who are captives and to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. All of us, in some ways, have been captive to the enemy. Some of us are still captive to the enemy. And we know that it hurts our witness. We know, or well, sometimes we feel inadequate because of that. We really don't want to proclaim to God. We don't really want to talk about what Jesus has done. But you know, that day is over. Look at here. Your sins have been forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far, the Bible said, he has removed our transgressions from us. 
But now if your sins are forgiven, do you think that the only thing you ought to do is find a job and raise your family and that's it? No, 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 no. It's not like that. It's not like that. The Lord saved you and he lifted you up, all right, and he delivered you. And many of you, he has healed, not just so you can come here and testify about it, but so that you can set others free who were in a position like yours. That's what it's about. This is the strong man's God. Go and get what you see in God's word. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yep. The potential, the potential, the potential, but you got to exercise the faith, develop it, grow into it. Amen. All right. All right. The doors of the church are open. We invite you to become a part of us. We're not a perfect church, but we're striving, striving to be all that God would have us to be. We invite you, if you don't have a church home, to come and become a part of this church family. If you don't know the Lord, we invite you to give your life to him right now. We have ministers and we have people who can facilitate that process so that you might be saved out of the kingdom of darkness, which is everything that is outside the kingdom of God. And we want you to be a member of the kingdom of God. We want you to be a member of God's family. We want you to be uh, our brother and sister in the Lord. We want you to experience the freedom and the deliverance that only Jesus can give. Will you come? Will you come? We invite you to do so right now. Let's.